Hi, everyone. This is Dr. Andrew Rimby, and welcome back to the Ivory Tower Boiler Room. I am so excited to be joined with writer, novelist, short story writer, author of 11 books, Laurie A. Egan. It is so nice to have you here in the Ivory Tower Boiler Room. And we're here to chat about what you said to me offline, off the recording, which is, you know, I don't always write queer characters. And I find that compelling because the novel that I was reading to prepare for our discussion is called The Firefly. And it's your most recent novel. And it has this really interesting romance between two young girls, but it's also not quite a lesbian love story. So like, I'm curious to have you jump in there. Like, what do you mean you don't always write queer characters? Because I find that compelling. Hi, Andrew. Um, thanks for having me on. And of course, yes, that's right. I, I tend to write the book that comes to me. And sometimes that includes gay characters. Sometimes it doesn't. Um, and sometimes it's love between or relationship between two women. And yet I've also done a comedy called Fabulous about a young uh, male opera singer who gets into all kinds of madcap adventures. So uh, I have sort of you know, even though I'm lesbian myself, I tend to write the books that I enjoy or whatever comes to me, that which might be from a setting or as in case of the Firefly, it was a what if plot that came to me. Mm. Well, um, since you are the writer of over 11 books and like I know you've done poetry collections, I think you said four poetry collections, volumes mm -hmm. Uh, you've written short stories. So you've really run the gamut. Like when I have authors here, a lot of the times they're so pigeonholed into one genre, they're nervous to go into other genres, like they find their comfort zone. But what is it about all these different genres of writing that you find compelling? Well, I started out more or less in psychological suspense. I had been reading Patricia Highsmith. Um, oh, yeah. And I guess she really uh, got me cooking. And uh, her sociopaths, which she probably was herself, for that matter, um, they really fascinated me. So, And I have a, a lot of interest in psychology. So uh, that was a natural area for me to go into. And so my first book is in that category. And I have uh, two coming up that are in that category. And I've got a few in between. So I would say that's my comfort zone, although I have I've written a lot of literary stories and a couple of literary novels, and I have one, one that I'm really excited about coming up in December. So um, I really do range all over the place. And I, you know, I, I'm not intimidated by the, the mm -hmm. genre classification very much, uh, but I do find it sometimes difficult because not every publisher is going to accept the range that I write in. And that's also true of my readership, which may vary all over the place because some of them may be in the uh, LGBTQ community or they might not. I have a lot of general readers. Um, so it, it, it does complicate things a little bit because I don't really get a niche group that reads my work. Um, and also that I can always you go to the same people to have it published. So it's a question of pigeonhole holding you in a way um, that what I love, though, is you have this freedom of genre expression. And like with mass market publishers, I find when I have those discussions, I see usually the author has to pick a lane. But what I find so refreshing is the plethora of narratives you have out there. So, you know, what is like your advice for someone like yourself, someone out there who's a writer or a burgeoning writer, and they really want to not have their artistic expression quelled? How do they go about that in this current marketplace? Well, I think they should start with short stories because that really lets you have um, playtime, so to speak, and lets you explore whatever you feel like exploring. So my my uh, short story collection, which is one of my earliest publications, uh, uh, really uh, allowed me to do that and go from literary to, you know, comedy to a little bit on the edge of very strange <laughs> to young adult. And as a result, uh, I think I learned 
where my comfort zone was and that to listen to whatever came to me and then to plow ahead. Now, that's not going to work for everybody because, like you said, I think a lot of people are more writers are more comfortable sort of sticking within one or two genres. Like I think of um, my friend uh, Rick Reed, who writes a lot of mystery books and also a lot of romance. And he sort of goes between the two and is very comfortable in both. Um, so I know there are, there are a number of people who do that, that toggle back and forth. I just have a wider range <laughs> than most well, people. I, I don't know why, but that's the way it is. <laughs> and isn't it interesting that even like the best-selling authors such as Stephen King, that he'll go under pseudonyms or um, so many have done that where you find that out that these mass market writers are trying to go under a different name because they're going in a complete opposite direction. And they think that if people see, oh, this book is by Stephen King and it's a romance, like how, like this does not make sense to us as a reader. Um, so yeah, that whole, and have you ever gone in? No, go ahead. By the publishers too, because oh, that's the publishers true. may want to just say, okay, um, Stephen King equates to this. Uh, and it's funny you should mention him because I'm reading a, a second book in a trilogy right now of his, which, believe it or not, I hadn't read any Stephen King all these years. Um, but I, I think that the publishers have a lot of influence and they really, particularly the trade houses, really encourage people to go down a trough and stay there. Now, if, if let's say Stephen King is writing romance, then all of a sudden, you know, they may come up with another name and then market that romance novelist. And uh, then that works really well. And then he would stick with that. So I think that the trade houses are a little more um, careful about how they're, they're very popular authors, uh, you know, what genres they stick to um, with, with a few exceptions. Well, and even some genres, I find when Fifty Shades of Grey came out, they really wanted the author to be anonymous in a way. Like sometimes if it's a really erotic conversation or they think it's going to really um, create a domino effect in the public conversation, like not knowing who the author is creates a publicity headline for them. Uh, so it's interesting to see all these methods. I mean, have you ever written anonymously, Laurie? And never. like, why did you do that? Oh, no. No, okay. I never have. I've always, uh, you know, used my name. And, um, but I agree. Like Elena Ferrante got a huge amount of buzz for her um, series because she was, uh, you know, writing under pseudonym and nobody knew who she was except for the publisher. And the publisher didn't say. So there was always a lot of, you know, people, the reporters wanted to know, who is she? Who is she? You know, so I agree. Sometimes that can be intriguing, uh, you know, to the press. Yeah. But no, it's a good public relations. <laughs> it's it's a whole public relations scheme. Um, but like what I am curious about is, um, you know, sitting with you and not having any preconceived notions of your craft. I love like going in as an unbiased spectator, which is, did you always see yourself as a writer? Was this something that you fell into? Like, was this something that entered after you were in a full-time career in another industry? Well, I started writing my first poem when I was seven <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I continued to write poetry pretty much until I don't write much right now because it's hard to write prose and poetry, you know, sort of at the same time. But I wrote my first novel, began it when I was 12, and then uh, short stories and poems through high school, which were published in our local, our, you know, my high school literary magazine. And then when I had to go to pick a college, ironically enough, I was accepted at Bennington and Bard College in creative writing particularly Bennington at that time was the toughest to get into. Um, but I wound up going to Carnegie Mellon University mm -hmm. and got a degree in graphic design and photography. Uh, my mother was a painter, but I cannot honestly recollect why I made that choice. I, I did always have a strong visual um, talent, but I never, I wanted to be a writer. That's what I wanted to be. 
so as a result, that was the one decision in my life I, I would take back. But um, I, I my first job was at Princeton University Press. So I was a promotion designer at first and then moved into the book design department. So I stayed in the publishing arena, learned a huge amount about bookmaking, editing, design, printing, production, all of the above, typography. And uh, I continued as a freelance book designer after I left the press, worked for about 22 publishers. And I also expanded my photography business. So I worked at Lincoln Center as a freelancer. Uh, the Metropolitan Opera, uh, work with Placido Domingo, all kinds of really interesting people. But finally, I said, what am I doing? I really need to get to my writing. And when my mother died, I inherited a little money and I was getting tired of being a book designer. So I shifted over into writing full time. And that was where it started. I started with stories, but then I, I have two early novels, one of which is going to be published in November which I really have worked over. So finally I've come home, so to speak, to what my first passion was, which was writing. So were you always um, Northeast based, it sounds like, or were, you know, yes. <laughs> so where, where did you grow up? I, I'm actually in the town that I was born in uh, and uh, which is on the Northern coast of New Jersey. Oh, I'm just, okay. I can see the ocean out my back uh, and the Manhattan skyline and the bay. And as so we're result, talking about like Atlantic Highlands slash Highlands, Sandy yeah. Hook. Right. Okay. I grew up in Atlantic Highlands mostly, but I um, I'm live in Highlands now. And then I went to high school here. But then other than the four years at in Pittsburgh for, at college, <laughs> um, I, I've been in New Jersey. I, I lived in Princeton for quite a few years in that area because that's where I was working. But I moved back here. I just missed the ocean. <laughs> just was like, and as soon as I did, that unlocked and brought me back to that writing stuff, you know, that inspiration that I had when I was a kid. Yeah, I feel the same way creatively in terms of living right by the Long Island Sound in Port Jefferson. And I grew up in Jersey by Philly. Um, and, but the Jersey Shore, there's something about the water that opens up those creative outlets. Yeah. Um, and it kind of grounds you. I need that grounding creatively. Um, so like, do you still do a lot of, to find ideas? Like, do you go into the city? Like, what's your process to kind of collect narratives? Well, um, I used to travel a huge amount, um, uh, you know, as a photographer as well. And I still teach uh, fine arts photography to private students. But um, over the last number of years, I've had some foot problems and gotten increasingly so that travel and photography, playing tennis, all the things I really love to do are pretty much out. So one of my challenges at the moment is to try to think of things that I can write about where I'm not creating as many new memories as I once was, you know, was, or, you know, in some of these locations that I really love to write about, like Venice, for example, or Mykonos or Santorini, places, Ireland, places I, I really spent some time uh, visiting. Uh, unfortunately, I'm just not able to sort of refresh that um experience so this has become all of a sudden a bit of a challenge for me so i'm um i've I, i'm embarrassed to say but i've dug out a really old manuscript that was just awful just awful uh but i think the plot was a good one and there is a a, a lesbian relationship in the in the uh novel so i'm just going through it and seeing if i can save it <laughs> yeah yeah so not to pass judgment on the Princeton environment, <laughs> excuse me, but I know, um, I'll edit this out, but <laughs> excuse me, Laurie. Um, so like not to judge the Princeton environment, Laurie, but I know that in terms of like preppiness, in terms of the artistic aesthetic, um, you know, being there, or even, you know, growing up 
in the Highlands area, did you feel that the LGBTQ community was fully celebrated? Like you were able to, you know, fully be yourself or were there aspects of, you know, closetedness or navigating that journey, you know, because we do have an intergenerational difference here. So I always like That's to quite acknowledge a large one, I think. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah the, the, when I was growing up, this was just, you know, being gay was just wasn't something one discussed or one did. I mean, it just was uh, completely taboo. And then um, when I moved to Princeton after I graduated college, uh that was just beginning things were really beginning to open up at that point in fact i was asked to lecture at the university and i did that through the uh as, under the auspices of the princeton university counseling center so uh and i came out at that point i wrote a uh an, an article to the editor of the new york times in which sort of i came out and of course everybody at princeton university press read the new york times every day so that sort of outed me to my you know colleagues uh so princeton actually was was pretty good pretty open and disco was hitting then so we had new hope mm -hmm. and uh all of those wonderful places to go and that so that was sort of a good period uh, there's not much activity here now, except for Asbury Park and Ocean Grove, which is just, it's like a half an hour, 40 minutes for me. So I don't, I don't go down there anymore, really, or I'm not really involved. So I am sort of cut off from the LGBTQ group and most of my friends are straight. So uh, just by accident, you know, it's not intentional. Yeah, but being in New Jersey or those of us in the Northeast, I feel that there is so much integrated LGBTQ culture now, or at least that's my town has pride flags. Like I know people who live in Atlantic Highlands and like there's a lot of, you know, artistic expression, Red Bank, that whole area. I was in Asbury for the first time this summer just because I always would go to Atlantic City and even Atlantic City now has a, I mean, it's always had an LGBTQ community, but it's starting to really grow with events. Um, so I feel like we are lucky to have so many communities that you can be your authentic self. Like there is um, enough people who are out that you just feel part of the fabric. I mean, that's how I feel. I'm not sure if you feel the same way, even in your well, town. Our our mayor is a lesbian, which is really yeah. pretty shocking because Highland is is really a, a tale of two two cities, so to speak, because you have the old fishermen and clamors and you know, very, very Republican, um, you know, not very open minded people. And then you have had a huge influx of uh newcomers who are much more liberal um and then there have always been a fair amount of writers and painters and uh artistic people in the area so it's a funny mix uh this is not a really typical town um, but i feel pretty comfortable here i don't make a big thing of it because uh, it just doesn't seem to me any need to and i'm not participating in any uh local groups but you know i think it's pretty friendly and i've read, read my books to community center and had 50 or 60 people show up and a lot of them have been gay themed so oh that's uh, wonderful it, you know most of the people that are there are, are straight so yeah so like do you still have communication with those at princeton in terms of like i find you being having been in academic publishing what an interesting coincidence since i just finished my phd in the summer um like now i'm pitching my dissertation to presses um like i'm doing a book proposal i'm going through the steps of which kind of publisher i want to go with um so do you find that academic publishing has hit a roadblock because i can see firsthand they're going through a lot of uh navigation right now in terms of marketability well, that marketability in the old days was never really that important. I mean, some of our books at Princeton sold 500 copies, so that was the the print run. Wow. Um, they they really, if the if the book was important or needed to be published from an academic point of view, then they would accept it. And I think that was pretty true of most of the publishers that I work with um, across the country. Now it it may may have changed a little bit, but I think some of the big guys like Princeton and Yale, 
uh, they still, you know, pretty much it's important to them what they publish rather than how many copies they're going to sell. Uh, and, you know, I know there's been a shift and that's definitely shifted in the trade market, but uh, the university press market's a little bit different. You, you know, you, depending on your, your thesis, it might be interesting to try University of Wisconsin Press. Mm, okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it's very male homoerotic themed. So um, that's where I would, if you're looking for that, that's where I where I'd go. Okay. Thank you. I always am, you know, keeping notes. Uh, so what I'm curious about is, do you find, um with your narratives, like let's take the Firefly, for example, with, you know, this girl who gets called the Firefly, she's very ethereal and sprightly. Um, she almost becomes just this constant image for our protagonist of the protagonist journeying to become an architect. And like now knowing about your graphic design background, I find that interesting. Uh, so do you find when you're kind of creating a romantic connection, like it's not necessarily about the sexuality of the characters, but just literally that spark, that light of flame, like why was it so important to get this firefly imagery out there? Well, I, as I said, I started out with a what if proposition, which the novel begins lakeside uh, in the Poconos in the mountains. Um, which I think is a rather romantic place. I think a lot of us have fantasies about our, our youth, uh, first loves, it, it, you know, in the lakes or the ocean by the ocean. Um, what I wanted to do was, uh, you know, what, what happened to Robin, the main character, is that her parents are fighting. They're, they're really on the verge of divorce. And so the mother is mad that the father didn't, you know, buy her scotch because they're drinkers, of course, back then. This is 1964. And so she trundles off without unpacking her car. They came in two cars. And then the uh, father, uh, thinking that the mother is coming back, and Robin goes upstairs to uh, unpack and relax a little bit. She comes back down. Her father's gone. You know, all this you know, clothes and everything, and the mother never returns. So here she is left with both mooring parents elsewhere. She doesn't know where they are. And of course, this is way before cell phones. Uh, mm -hmm. So that was the what if proposition that set this book off. But then the Firefly idea came to me, and maybe this was a nascent thing that came from the Outlander opening scene where the women are circling around either with torches, I can't remember, or, you know, it's at night around the stones. So I don't know whether that that's what did it or not. But I really like that idea of that spark, as you said, uh, the idea of a first love and how bright and shining that is. And uh, I even I hadn't thought of it until today when I was thinking about your questions ahead of time. Uh, even the name Robin Bennett, Robin, is like the first bird of spring. So in a sense, it is the uh, beginning of everything. And I think that that period of innocence that many of us experienced when we were 14 years old or so, and we we're beginning to be really aware of our sexuality, we're falling in love for the first time. I, I think that's what I wanted to capture is that brightness and that excitement. And and at that, at that time in 64, however, this was not something anybody did so she also you know became very aware of uh, that she was in in territory that she shouldn't be in in her mind yeah i hope well, you enjoyed you this portion from the ivory tower boiler room podcast to listen to the rest of the episode and watch it head to our patreon that's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash ivory tower boiler room and just for you all, I'm giving a promo deal for our Patreon. So for one week, you get a free trial. Join the ITBR professor level, which is $10 a month. But again, you get a one week free trial and you can watch the rest of this episode and also see our full catalog of unedited and ad free video episodes, exclusive audio episodes, including Mary to Pippi's True Crime and Academia series 
our Queer as Folk and Smash TV show rewatch podcast episodes. You're going to unlock everything. And also you'll see that every month we host a book club. So you can also join our book club. Okay, see you all on the Patreon.